Welcome to worship at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Boise, Idaho, on this Sunday, July 31st, 2022. Jesus wants you to be rich. Really. If you think there's a catch in that, you're right, there is. Starting today and for the next five or six weeks at least, Jesus is going to be talking about money, your money. One of those things you don't talk about in polite company, the kind of questions you just don't ask, but if you don't bring it up, Jesus will. I just kind of feel like I ought to warn you. Jesus is gonna be talking about your stuff, like it was his stuff. When he's not talking about money, he's gonna be talking about honor and power and privilege and how that's your privileged life and what you're gonna do with it. <clears throat> he will talk about your work and what's worth working for. And if your work, or your rest for that matter, isn't setting people free, what is it doing instead? When he's not talking about the wealthy, he will be talking about the poor who can't repay you anything. He will cut down what you have built up and put the fire to your successes. And by the end, he will be telling you to choose life. But you will have to hate the things you love and give up your possessions to do it. And he's not joking. He's not pulling any punches. punches. He's not fooling around. He's not just exaggerating to make a point. He's serious. Deadly serious. Because it's your life. Your life. Your life that Christ is so in love with. Your life is the treasure. Your life is everything to him. Your life, full and, yes, rich. Your life is at stake here. Your life. Jesus wants you to be rich, but rich toward God. So choose life. That is God's will for you. Choose life. For your life is a matter of choices. Good ones and bad ones. We begin our worship with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose steadfast love endures forever. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your path, but have chosen our own way. Instead of putting others before ourselves, we long to take the best seats at the table. When met by those in need, we have too often passed by on the other side. Set us again on the path of life. Save us from ourselves and free us to love our neighbors. Amen. Hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are free to love as Christ loves. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Good morning. How are you today? It's been a few weeks since I've seen you, hasn't it? I hope you've had a fun summer. I spent a couple of weeks up at camp. One of the reasons why I love going to Luther Heights is because we get to experience God in so many different creative ways. We sing silly songs, we worship outside, and pray all kinds of different ways. I really hope that those of you who went to camp had a good time too. Can you see what these kids are doing? They are coloring, but what if I told you they could be praying too? Just because we're not at camp doesn't mean we can't pray in all sorts of different and creative ways. We're used to prayer looking like this, or this, or this, but sometimes prayer can look like this, or this, or even this especially when we don't have the words to say what we want to say. I'm going to read to you today, but instead of reading to you from our children's story Bible, I'm going to read to you from a book called Praying in Color for Kids. Chapter 1, Prayer Problems. If you have had one or more of these prayer problems, you're not alone. Join the Frustrated Prayers Club. You feel antsy and fidgety when you try to be still and pray. You start to pray, then fall asleep. You're tired of the same old prayers you've said since preschool. You run out of words, but the prayer doesn't feel finished. You can't wait for prayer time to be over and done with. You can't find the words to say what you think or feel. You wonder whether God is listening or even cares. You want to like praying, but it just feels like another chore. You start to pray, but realize that you're thinking about tomorrow's soccer game, a friend's sleepover, or homework. You tell God exactly how you feel, and then wonder whether God will be angry. Do any of those sound like you? A lot of them sound like me. Often I'll begin praying right before I go to sleep, thinking about all of the things that are on my heart and whoever pops into my head, and the next thing I know, it's morning. And then I can feel a little sad because I feel like I didn't get to finish my prayers before I went to sleep. And sometimes it feels a little weird to tell God when you're angry or if your prayers feel angry, but one thing I do know is that God already knows, and you can't make God angry by telling him that you are. For the next few weeks, let's learn a new way to pray. Let's pray in color. But for now, let's just pray before we go. Loving God, we thank you for all of the different ways that we can pray. Sitting, standing, lying down, whispering, yelling, singing, or even just feeling. Remind us that it doesn't matter if our prayers are angry, sad, or happy, or ones we've known our whole lives. It just matters that we keep praying so that we can keep our relationship with you and build our relationship with others every day. Amen. We'll see you soon. Hear this, all you peoples. Give ear, all you who dwell in the world. You of high degree and low, rich and poor together. 
May we thy bounties thus as stewards true receive, and gladly as thou blessed us to thee our first fruits give. Why should I be afraid in evil days? when the wickedness of those at my heels surround me. The wickedness of those who put their trust in their own prowess and boast of their great riches. The captive to release to God the lost to bring to teach the way of life, and peace it is a Christ-like thing. Mm -hmm. One can never redeem another, or give to God the ransom for another's life. For the ransom of a life is so great that there would never be enough to pay it, in order to live forever and ever and never see the grave. And we believe thy word, though dim our faith may be. Whate'er we do for thine, O Lord, we do it unto thee. For we see that the wise die also. Like the dull and stupid, they perish and leave their wealth to those who come after them. Their graves shall be their homes forever, their dwelling places from generation to generation. Though they had named lands after themselves, even though honored, they cannot live forever. They are like the beasts that perish. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Benevolent God, you are the source, the guide, and the goal of our lives. Teach us to love what is worth loving, to reject what is offensive to you, and to treasure what is precious in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from Ecclesiastes, the first chapter. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. I, the teacher, when king over Israel and Jerusalem, applied my mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to human beings to be busy with. I saw all the deeds that are done under the sun, and see, all is vanity and a chasing after wind. I hated all my toil in which I had toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to those who come after me. And who knows whether they will be wise or foolish? Yet they will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned and gave my heart up to despair concerning all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave all to be enjoyed by another who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What do mortals get from all the toil and strain with which they toil under the sun? For all their days are full of pain, and their work is a vexation. Even at night their minds do not rest. This also is vanity. There is nothing better for mortals than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in their toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from Him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? Word of God, Word of Life. Thanks be to God.
The Gospel is from Luke, the 12th chapter. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me as a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to, it, to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told him a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all the grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, <clears throat> this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. He made some really good decisions in his life, they said, with evident admiration. I was listening in, eavesdropping again, as is my want to do, sit back quietly in coffee shops and bars and just about anywhere else, and you can hear the thoughts of their hearts. When I'm scratching my mind for a sermon, you don't want to be sitting anywhere nearby. They were talking about somebody not there, somebody they knew. He made some really good decisions in his life, and now he was a billionaire. Well, you got to respect that. Don't we all wish we had made such good decisions? Don't we wish we had such good decisions to make? Because to make good decisions, you have to have some good choices to choose from and opportunity to, to choose them. <laughs> Sometimes you can turn a bad situation into a good one. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes hard lives take more than hard work because nobody I know works harder than the poor I know. She was close to 80 in another conversation. She looked tired. And she was hoping she could get something for dinner because she said, I've got nothing else to eat. Nothing in the fridge, nothing on the shelf. This was the best decision available to her. Can you spare a dollar? What's in your barn? Someone in the crowd, someone, it could have been anyone, could have been you, could have been any of us. You never know who's listening. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, said to Jesus, that could be a good decision, Ask Jesus, or not so good, it depends. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, Friend, friend, call him friend. That's hopeful. Maybe this is a good decision, depends. Friend, who made me your financial advisor? You think God is your stockbroker? You think savior means investment advice, stocks and bonds and savings accounts? You want the Messiah on your side in a bear market? But friend, who set me as a judge or arbitrator over you? Well, now this isn't looking so good. Maybe asking Jesus was a bad decision. Jesus is Lord, sure, but discipleship is a call to responsibility. Your life is a matter of of choices, and whether those choices are good, not for you, but for others. And this is the problem with prayer. This is what makes it so difficult. Sometimes you just want to give it up completely. You're supposed to be able to get what you want from God, or at least what you need. Just last week, Jesus was encouraging us to pray, even to be persistent about it, to be God's little pest 
to bother God with your asking. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you, he said. And don't stop until you get it. And, well, you should. And yet, who made God your cash cow? Who made God the quartermaster of the universe? Is Jesus Lord or hired hand? Is God master or your servant? Is God your errand boy or is God God? It's so tempting. It may be the sin of our times, if it wasn't so clearly the sin of every time, to assume that God's will and our will is the same thing. That if it seems good to us, it must be good to God. If it seems like the right thing to us, then we must be righteous. Or if it's our will, it must be God's will. And how could God oppose it? Let's make it a law and make everybody do our will. Oh, people of God, doesn't our history prove that we have never been so wrong than we are, when we are so sure we are right? God will be generous. Jesus will be gracious and merciful. But Jesus will not be manipulated. During the Civil War, as the story goes, Abraham Lincoln was asked whose side he thought God was on. He answered that the question was not whose side God was on, but are we on God's side? The question is not about what God is or isn't doing, but what are we doing? We pray not to get our desires from God, but that our desires may be like God's. And, we, and so we are saved by grace and told to live by grace and that it is all by grace and grace alone. Because if it is, if it is all by grace and not by works, not by your good and righteous decisions, but by the will of God to be always a God of grace, then any ability you or I thought we had to manipulate God is removed. And Jesus said to them, take care. Make good decisions, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. What? Abundance of possessions? What could be more American than that? But Jesus is not an American. And then Jesus told him a parable about a man who made some good decisions in his life. Well, that and fertile soil and some good weather. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. Good decision. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Bad decision, not enough barns. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build the larger ones, and there I will store my grain and my goods. Good decision. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Good decision or bad decision? Didn't we just read that from the book of Ecclesiastes? Eat, drink, and be merry? That's biblical. That's the advice of scripture. This is a righteous man. And isn't it so? Doesn't God want the best for you? Doesn't God want a bull market? Shouldn't you have enough to eat and enough to drink, even plenty to eat and drink, to enjoy this life, the very pleasure of it? The biblical fool of Ecclesiastes is the person who works too hard and too long. The vanity of the person who never stops to enjoy life. The wasted life of someone so concerned with the abundance of possessions that she never relaxes, never stops to just eat, drink, and be merry. Might it not be that the question God will ask you at the end of your life is not, well, what have you got to show for yourself? But rather, did you have a good time? Did you have a good time? And what difference would it make? What lovely difference might it make if that question, if that was the question you had to answer? Did you have a good time? I think so. I think so. I think that is at least half of it. 
Doesn't God want the best for you? Shouldn't you have enough to eat and enough to drink, even plenty to enjoy this life, the very pleasure of it? Yes, yes, you should. But no, no. God wants everybody to have enough to eat and enough to drink and more than enough to be merry. So God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Do you see how Jesus has taken this man's question about inheritance and who gets the lion's share and turned it on its head? The things you have prepared, Whose will they be? You live in a big barn, others live on the street. You're worried about what you can get your hands on, but what can you put into the hands of others? The things you have prepared, whose will they be? How much good can you do with your goods? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich toward God. If storing up treasures for, one, for themselves is the opposite of being rich toward God, then isn't Jesus asking us to consider how to store up treasures for others? If building more barns is a bad decision, wouldn't building more homes for those who need them be a good decision? Be rich toward God. That's your faith. The issue is trust, not your trust fund. If one's life doesn't, doesn't consist in the abundance of possessions, then what does a good life consist of? You are only as rich as the things you can do without. If you can't give it away, you don't own it. It owns you. You are only as wealthy as you can be generous. You are blessed to be a blessing. How do we set a table in the world at which all may eat and drink to their full and leave as merry as we are? And what of this table? This table we set each week, these silly little creamer cups with their sip of wine and their morsel of bread. This place, this sanctuary we, that we call our church home, the barns we build to store up an abundance of prayer and worship and spirit at our spiritual center. Are we rich toward God? To whom then shall we give it away? And could we find the joy in that? Wouldn't that be a good time? Amen. Trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. O God, you are wholeness. Where there is division in your church, bring reconciliation and healing. Guide the work of theologians, Sunday school teachers, seminary professors, and all who provide instruction for the building up of your church. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O God, you are the source of all life. Where creation cries out in distress, bring relief and renewal. Bless farmers, ranchers, distributors, and all who provide our food. 
Nourish the land and all its habitants. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O God, you are wisdom. Where nations and communities yearn for peace, bring justice. Strengthen those who toil for the welfare of others, especially military personnel, police, first responders, and activists, and for the healing of the nations. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O God, you are life. Where your people are overwhelmed with the busyness of life, bring encouragement. Accompany all who experience emotional, mental, or physical distress. Renew us at your table of mercy. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Where scarcity and anxiety pervade your church, bring abundance and vitality. Guide the work of church councils and committees and give them clarity for the work of ministry in this place. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O God, you are resurrection. We give you thanks for all your saints. Inspire us by their example of faithful living to set our minds on things above and to be rich in love toward you. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love. Through Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. with you and also with you lift up your hearts we lift them to the Lord let us give thanks to the Lord our God it is right to give God thanks and praise it is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you almighty and merciful God through our Savior Jesus Christ who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name, giving thanks for Christ, who comes to us in this holy meal. Holy God, our maker, redeemer, and healer, in the harmonious world of your creation, the plants and animals, the seas and stars were whole and well in your praise. When sin had scarred the world, you sent your Son to heal our ills and to form us again into one. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his acts of healing, his body given up, and his victory over death, we await that day when all the peoples of the earth will come to the river to enjoy the tree of life. Send your spirit upon us and this meal. As grain scattered on the hillside become one bread, so let your church be gathered from the ends of the earth that all may be fed with the bread of life, your Son. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, 
The power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Gathered and scattered in our homes that we may be, today we come together as one church, united with the church of every time and place. If you've been able to gather bread and wine, or if you have but wine or bread alone, please share it now with those gathered with you, or share it yourself with me. The body of Christ given for you, The blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Life-giving God, through this meal you have bandaged our wounds and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live for others, both friend and stranger, that all may come to know your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Did you have a good time? Not, well, what have you made of yourself? Might the question be instead, did you have a good time? I think so. I think that is at least half of it. But the other half is just as important. Did you forgive as you have been forgiven? Were you merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful? Did you live graciously with others as God was gracious with you? Did you have a good time? Did you make sure you weren't the only one? Were you able to relax, eat, drink, and be merry? And did you do everything in your power to make sure others had enough to eat and enough to drink and more than enough to be merry? May you be rich. May your life this week be rich and abundant and overflowing. Be rich. Be rich toward God. The God of peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you, comfort you, and show you the path of life this day and always. Amen. <laughs>